presentation, I'd like to introduce David Desitels. He's our Vice President uh, of Sales for CSSI. He's an engineer. And there's not many people, I don't think there's anybody in this room that spent more time looking at these regs. I think David told me he went through some of these uh, eight-hour courses two or three times. But, uh, four or five. Four or five times. God bless you, David. Yeah. Uh, again, everybody, David Desitels. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Question for the audience. How many people have uh, been to a webinar or listened to a webinar online about the tangible property regs? Okay, so maybe 10%. How many of you have been reading about this? Okay. How many people think you've got a handle on it? That you understand it? Okay, that's what I thought. It's, uh, I don't know many experts in this arena. I've spent 500 hours looking at these things. I'm still not completely comfortable with what's going on. My background is not a CPA, I'm an engineer. So I'm approaching this from a process standpoint. Engineers are about efficiency, creating processes, uh, creating things to uh, accomplish something. So the purpose of my talk, my gift to you, is to try and give you a process to first of all, educate yourselves to understand what the regulations are, first steps that you need to be taking next week, how to get the staff on board or how to educate them. What are some of the tools that you're going to need to be able to implement this for your clients? What's the internal processes that you need to set up? One of the documents that you have is a uh, the phases checklist to where I have talked to CPA firms around the country, have spoken around the country, and I see some distinct phases that they have gone through in implementing this. So I put together a checklist, which you have access and you may have printed out, to say here are some of the distinct phases that I see people going through. So I can't stretch your imagination enough to understand in everything. You know, we want to be conscious and competent in our jobs, and you are in most phases of that, but the rules of the game have changed. What you, what you knew about depreciation or repair regulations has changed. The quicker we realize I've got to give up what I've always done to adopt these new regulations, the, the better it's going to be. So right now, across America, the majority of CPAs are unconscious and incompetent in that they don't know what they need to know and they can't do what they have to do for their clients. We were with uh, someone yesterday here locally I've done all these returns and they're sitting on my desk because I don't know what to do with the 3115s. I did the work, but I know I need to do something, but I can't go any further. So what I'm trying, going to try and do is make you aware of some of the process that you need to become uh, competent. So the best I can hope for is get you from unconscious to dazed and confused. If we can get to dazed and confused, you'll be ahead of most of the CPAs in America in implementing this. So, again, uh, my favorite uh, quote by Jack Welsh, the operative assumption today is that someone somewhere has a better idea. And the operative compulsion is to find that idea, learn it, and put it into action fast. So that's why you're here in the heart of tax time. When you should be working hard for your clients, you're here out of concern or desperation to find something to help you get going. Because the IRS didn't do a very good job of giving you steps that you need to take to implement this. So we're going to go an overview of the regulations. I'm going to show you the greatest impacts that you have, both opportunities for your clients and liabilities for you, how to apply the partial disposition elections. Late partial disposition, some of your clients have won the lottery. The rules of the game have changed, therefore there's new winners and there's new losers. The new winners are someone that had a building that threw something away, did a renovation, remodel, and all that material is still on the books. It's your challenge to get that off the books. The timeline is you have to do that in tax year 2014. So some of your clients have won the lottery. You're holding the ticket and you have to cash it for them. The problem is, is you don't know who in your portfolio won the lottery. You gotta go find them and then tell them, hey, you won, and I'm gonna help you get you your tax deductions that you deserve. Safe harbors for your clients, we'll go over that, and how cost segregation is going to help you. 
Make friends with a cost segregation specialist because a lot of you have situations where you won't be able to do the calculations for your clients and you're going to have to bring in someone to help. How many people going through taking their CPA exam said, I can't wait till I get to work with engineers to do my clients' taxes, right? It's, it's, it's not fun at all. You can see here, I have no CPA experience. The only taxes I do are mine. So Bob Goldfarb is going to be my wingman to handle some of the very technical tax questions that you may have. Um, it's the world's hardest public affairs job. You've seen some of my work before. This is my job, my job site. Chinook helicopter dropping sandbags into the breach in New Orleans, Louisiana. I was a public affairs specialist for the Corps of Engineers. Always fun to have a client that just wrecked a major metropolitan area. That's a, that's a tough job. Now, saying world's hardest public affairs job may be a little stretch. It may be a, you know, I, I've stretched the truth a little bit, but, you know, what, what's that going to hurt, right? It's, uh, for those of you all on the other end, my picture with Brian Williams. <laughs> Brian Williams, Chinook helicopter in New Orleans, Louisiana. No dead bodies where we were, none whatsoever. So I, I got a chance to work with uh, guys like this to be able to tell a very complex story or be able to relate a very complex story and tell that story to the media. I'm going to try and do that with you today in that I'm going to take a very complex set of regulations and try and boil it down to the most important parts that you need to understand so that you can go, oh, okay, that's what that means. Now I can get going. I'm going to point you to resources. The most important thing I can do is point you to the resources that you need to start looking at to get you going. It's all about can I expense this or capitalize it? We have hundreds of pages of documents just to answer that simple question, can I expense this and write it off or do I have to capitalize it? So the tangible property regulations are all about capital expenditures, segregating those from supplies, repairs, and maintenance. I can boil this whole thing down to one sentence. We have to capitalize everything unless there's an exemption. That may be the thing that you tell your client. The rules of the game have changed. We have to capitalize everything unless there's an exemption. What I have found with speaking with CPAs across the country is the exemptions are pretty good. There's a lot of people that are coming out to the better with these regulations than they were before. Uh, roof membranes, $30,000 roof membrane. Oh, that's a lot of money. We always capitalize that. By these regulations, no, you'll be able to write that off. So the big guys, it's, it's an advantage. For the smaller guy that has 10 rental, hop, 10 rental properties and 10 LLCs, you've got to create a 3115 for each of those LLCs. You're going to have to charge him a lot of money to create 10 different documents to get him into the game. So those guys may not have, have one, but there are a lot of people that are saying, these are actually good once I understand them and once I can relate them to the client and have the client start using them, it may be to their advantage. But man, it's messy. It's not fun, it's not good, it's not easy. So here you are today, during tax time, doing this. When they invited me to come and speak about two weeks ago, it's like, it's tax time, we're gonna have 20 people in the room. I'm not flying up to New York from Baton Rouge, Louisiana for 20 people in the room. We've had over 300 that have signed up, is that right? Um, that's unprecedented. So I know there's a great need. So let's get into this. Here's what I see as the phases of implementation. Uh, education, you have to first educate yourself. And next you have to identify the clients that are most affected by this. You have to, it's a, someone that has a building. Someone that, that has a building. Manufacturing processes. Rank your clients. Who do I need to get to first? Who can I extend? Uh, we'll show you some of the tools and templates that are available to you that will make available to you and, and how to get going. Appoint a TPR leader and committee. How many sole practitioners here? So quite a bit. So you're the TPR czar. It's you. You're an army of one, right? It's your job to, to get this, learn this, know this, and start applying it for your clients. For those that uh, have uh, larger staffs, I suggest to you make a couple people really smart on this and let ever, everyone else come to them to try and learn these things. Here's the first step in educating yourself. How many people have seen the resource guide online uh, along with these presentations? Okay. 
download that. It's an interactive document that's going to lead you to some of the best articles online. I've spent hundreds of hours reading everything online, and what I did was I put them together in an order that's going to take you from very simple to complicated. The first one to read is the quick summary chart of the Tangible Property Rec. Six pages, bullet forms from the AICPAs. Print that out, keep it on your desk to reference while you're reading these other articles. Implementing the new Tangible Property Rec, Journal of Accountancy, I'll, I'll reference that as well. Written policy template from the AICPA. How many people have a written capitalization policy that they're handing out to their clients to say, hey, you need this in place for the de minimis safe harbor. Want to write off $500 or less? You need a capitalization policy. Here, here's one you can use. I've got that template for you from the AICPA to where you can very easily get that going. CCH articles, probably the one in the middle is where I would, oops, where I would recommend that you start. Excuse me while I catch up here. Um, it's 44 pages, but it's a great, great overview of the regulations. It ties back to the, uh, to the to the citations, to the codes that you might need to know. Uh, so, um, so read that. So, um, and, and I'm telling you this because I know it's been successful. I had uh, one gentleman that um, middle of January knew nothing, came to one of my webinars on, online. He says, I listened to your hour and a half webinar. I started reading these articles. Uh, the next thing that he did was he got this eight hour course from CCH. Eric Wallace, eight-hour course that will take you through is. If you click on the link, it will take you there. It's about $250, so you're going to have one of the nation's most knowledgeable experts at your disposal. It's better than having him there in person because you can rewind it and play it a number of times. Uh, I understand since September 29th, he just did a couple more courses last week. So try and get the most recent ones uh, and, and listen to those. It's well worth the money. Again, in the hour that I have, I can't give you all the things that you need, but in eight hours, he can get you up to competent. He can get you up and going to show you exactly what you need to do to fill out these 3115. So I strongly suggest that you do that. After you listen to that, go to this website. It's Eric Wallace's website. He's already engineered everything. He's created all the documents. He has 20 something 3115 examples. He'll let you look at them for two days. So even if you don't want to buy the kit, you can go and look at it. I would suggest that you go to the site and download the uh, table of contents. It's going to show you all the documents that you might need to implement this for your clients. It's going to be a good aha moment. It's like, oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah, I need that. Go online, the free trial, 21 examples of 3115s. You can compare what you create to what he's created, or you can see what he's created in borrow some of that material free of charge. A lot of you will see what's necessary and go, okay, I'm going to spend the money. I'm out of time. I got to get going. I can't recreate the wheel. I'm just going to get in. I'm going to go. So that's my best advice to you. And those are some of the best resources that are available out there. Read this book, Who Moved My Cheese? IRS didn't move your cheese. They're eating your lunch. These, these are tough regulations. They're all encompassing. They are a lot of work. Journal of Accountancy article by Christian Wood in February was one of the first ones to talk about your liability, Circular 230 issues in doing this. It's a great article to, to read. Let me show you a couple things from this. These rules will affect every taxpayer that uses tangible property in its business. Have you come to the conclusion that you're going to have to do something for just about every one of your clients? that you're going to have to fill out a 3115 for just about every one of your clients. When I give these presentations, I see the looks in, in CPA's faces, EA's faces. They have that I can't even moment where you go, I can't even. Ugh. We, we had a lot of those last night. Uh, so what I want to do is, again, show you some of these things to show you some of the challenges that you're up against in doing this and give you the resources to get going. The rules are all encompassing and complex. That's an understatement. Taxpayer may need to devise new collection procedures to capture the necessary data to implement these regulations. You're going to have to work with your clients to do things differently. They're going to need more buckets. They're going to track more information. They're going to need to process things differently. 
So not only do you need to educate yourself for filling out these 3115s, you've got to educate your client as well. So it's, it, it's challenging to, number one, understand this, and number two, get it going. Circular 230 may present challenges to practitioners in signing tax returns of clients that have not implemented the final regulations. You guys are here trying to learn this. I can't tell you how many CPAs I've heard go, I'm not doing anything. I, I'm, I'm just not doing this. Bad. Going to get their, going to get their clients in a lot of trouble. This is, this, these regulations are going to create opportunity for the people here in this room. It's kind of like the stress test on the banks after the financial crisis. They saw who was solvent, who wasn't. This is a stress test on the CPA community. They're going to see who's competent and who's not. And if you're competent and you can get up and going and you can bring these opportunities to your clients, you're going to pick up business in years to come when CPAs that didn't do what they needed to do will come looking for a competent CPA to help them. So if you can get up and going, here's your marketing material. When did your CPA talk to you about tangible property regs? Did your CPA tell you about the late partial dispositions to be able to write off those items that were thrown away? They didn't? You mean they're still on the books? They missed that? That's $100,000 deduction that you missed? What else did they miss? Let's have a cup of coffee. So my job today is to try and help you uh, understand these. And here we are. Due to the challenges of the regulations, waiting to address these issues until completing the 2014 tax return is ill-advised. <coughs> but here we are. So what was supposed to be a summer project then went to a fall activity, and now we're in what I call TP Armageddon. It's trying to figure out what this is very quickly so that you can start getting these things filed. So that's what I'm going to try and do today. So my job is to help you get the cheese for your client and keep your head out the trap. It's not the first mouse that gets the cheese, it's the second one because the first had his head in, in the trap. Why is this so complicated? How do I explain this to my clients? Late partial disposition, what is that? That's a use it or lose it situation. What's an improvement standard? So let's, let's get into these things. One of the things to understand or to be able to explain to your clients is why are we having to do this? This is different than you've ever experienced with the IRS before because in the past, what the IRS did was they gave you a mandate and said start doing these new regulations from this day going forward. These regulations are a little bit different. They started in January 1st, 2014. There was something that you should have done before that date. You're mandated to follow these new regulations, but you have to request permission to follow these regulations. You just can't start doing them. You have to request permission to follow what they want you to do. So here's 12 little words that are worth a billion dollars to the CPA community. A taxpayer must secure the IRS's consent before changing its accounting method. That's what you're going to have to tell your clients. We have to change our accounting method to these new methodologies. We're required to do this and we have to get consent to be able to do that. And that consent comes in the form of a 3115. So America, get your billions back. This line says from the IRS to the CBA community, CPAs, we've got your back, now go get your billions from America. Because there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of hours that you're going to have to charge to be able to put these in, into effect. Okay, so in adopting these, these methods. There's six annual elections. These three are the most important, partial asset disposition. Anybody familiar with that, partial asset disposition? Is that a new term to, to anyone? Small taxpayer safe harbor, de minimis safe harbor. So we'll be going through these. Um, so those are just annual elections. You're gonna check the box on the software. It's gonna print out the necessary uh, paragraph that goes on the return. And that's something that you'll elect every um, every year. Partial asset disposition, tax year 2014. You're going to have to ask your client, did you throw anything away? Is there any renovations that you did on the building? Is there anything that you threw away that's still on the books? Because we need to write that off and we need to write it off in tax year 2014. So that's one of the questions that you need to start asking each of your clients 
have you thrown anything away that's still on the depreciation schedule? Because we need to write that off. If we don't, we lose the opportunity to write that off, and we'll have to continue to depreciate that. Request permission going forward, 3115s. These are the areas where you're going to have to request permission and fill out 3115s. Does your client want to write off repairs and maintenance? Yeah, requires 3115. Do they want to write off materials and supplies? Do they want to write off the stapler? <laughs> yeah, okay, you're gonna to have to request permission. Unit of property, every building is now a unit of property. Anyone familiar with that? Anyone read that, know that, okay? So that's quite a bit of difference. Well, you have to adopt that. Uh, improvement standards, anyone familiar with the improvement standards? Betterment, adaptation, restoration, anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, I know where, I know where we need to go. So, so all of these will be on the same 3115, with, with the exception of removal costs. Adjustments looking back. So there are some 3115s where you're going to have to apply them retroactively. You're going, you're going to have to uh, late partial asset disposition. So in tax year 2014, you have the opportunity to look back over the life of that client's ownership of the building and write off whatever is no longer there to identify the parts and pieces that were thrown away, or equipment, or whatever it is that's still on the depreciation schedule. Tax year 2014 is the last chance to clean up that depreciation schedule, get that off the books, and take those tax deductions. Repairs and maintenance. You can look back if there have been capitalized projects where we can now apply the repairs and maintenance standards. There may be parts of that capitalized project that now can be called a repair and be written off the books. Removal cost. What did it cost to do a demolition of a building? Auto dealership, you know, they rip off the front wall and then they put those new branding walls, those million dollar things that makes it look, the Chevrolet dealership looks at the, like the next one and the next one. Well, there was a cost to rip all that stuff off. That can now be written down. Cost segregation is gonna be, be the key in that. So here's the most common 3115 that you'll, you'll file. Lots of people ask, can I put multiple method codes, multiple 3115s together? And the answer is yes. Here's the most common one, 184, 186, 192. So on 13115, you'll be adopting your clients into these new regulations by filling out this 3115. So repairs and maintenance, a method code 184 on the 3115. You'll have to cite the particular citation that, that's listed there. Materials and supplies, 186 and 187. Those are for um, incidental and non-incidental materials and supplies that we'll talk about. Every building is a unit of property, so every client that has a building, you'll have to adopt the unit of property 184. You can see method code 184, it has about 50 different citations under it. That, that um, page that Eric was waving around, the, uh, the, the method codes and citations, um, I think I see a majority of you have a copy of that. So that's a list of the citations that you, and the method codes that you might wanna look through and say, which of these apply to my clients? And then go ahead and put that onto the 3115. Betterment adaptation restoration. So this is the new test the improvement standard, each time there's an invoice that comes through, your client's gonna to come to you next week and go, we spent $25,000 on an air conditioner. What do we do with that? Can we call that a repair? Or is that a capitalized expense? Well, there's a process to, to dis, decide, was it a betterment, adaptation, or improve, or a restoration? If it was, it's an improvement and we'll have to capitalize it. We'll, we'll talk about how to do that. Routine maintenance, safe harbor, acquisition of property, uh, acquisition of property is probably a protective filing there uh, for financial cost in buying anything, but you probably want to uh, put that as well. Here's some of the method codes for cost segregation. If you have an impermissible method on the depreciation schedules and you have to change your permissible, that's uh, code seven. Partial asset disposition, again, for late partial asset dispositions and hold dispositions, 205 and 206. We'll talk about that. Uh, each of those, um, Seven and 196 can be together, seven and 205 can be together. 21 is on its uh, own, uh, 3115. 
And there's some uh, examples there on where to send that. So the majority, just about all of these are going to go to Ogden, Utah. They opened up a special processing facility to process all these things in Ogden, Utah. I think that's where the, uh, the warehouse is that you saw in Raiders of the Lost Ark, where it's that big, that's where all this stuff is going. It's just going to go in a warehouse and they'll probably never look at it again. I don't know if they will or not, but that's, that's the fear. So. Uh, these, these slides are not in your handout. And, and we're <laughs> just these. Uh, what, and, and, and what it is is specific instructions on filling out the 3115. So, so after sending them my slide deck, they said, Let, let's give them some help in filling out the 3115. So we will be working together to give you some specific yes, no, yes, no. Here's all the ones, here's all the codes that can go together. Um, Automatic method changes, let's see. Um, uh, I'll get to that in a couple slides. Okay, so, so here's something that's important on understanding how, how do you mail these in? Where do you send these? So with the, um, with the 3115, you're going to have the 3115 document, eight pages. You may have a 481A adjustment along with that. You'll have the power of attorney um, document with that, uh, related parties document with that, and any attachments that you have to the 3115. The challenge that you're, so that's five sets of documents that you're going to have with this. The, the challenge that you have is that this 3115 hasn't been revised since 2009. So we have all these new regulations in a document from 2009 and they don't go together well. So you've got a number of check marks on the 3115 that says explain. Give us an explanation, give us more detail. And so the challenge is putting together your templates, putting together all of that explanation uh, to go onto the 3115. And I think in talking to Bob yesterday, Bob was, uh, I'll commit Bob to this, but what would be great for the organization is to come up with some templates, some examples of what these 3115 should look like uh, for, for you to use. Again, go to Eric Wallace's site, get the two-day free trial, and see what they look like. They're lengthy, but it's just a matter of going through the 3115 and answering the questions, having the right method codes, and again, selecting from the 50 uh, possible uh, uh, citations to, to list on there. Easy, right? No problem. I, I'm getting a dazed and confused look It's uh, from, from a lot of you. I know it's a lot to understand. A lot of it won't make sense, but again, if you'll go in and read some of the some of the documents that we had, it'll start to make sense to you. Here's, here's one of the things I need to, to share with you on shipping this to Ogden, Utah. So what you want to do is you want to get all these documents assembled, signed, into your office. Don't let your client send them in. Make sure they come back to you and then make sure that they go in before the return or at the time of the return. If they go in afterwards, it's like you never filed them. So, have to go in before the return or with the return. You will take the original, the signed original, and scan that. Make a scan copy of that. You send the original to Ogden, Utah. You can put the scan copy with the return. Or your, your software might create these documents as well. And those will be unsigned, but I'm told that probably it's okay because you have the electronic signature authorization to do that. There's a lot of debate as to whether you have to do the scan copy attached or whether you can just let the software create your 3115s. So that's, um, but make sure the original sign go to uh, Ogden, Utah. Uh, mailing it and with the return. That's right. Has has to go in both ways. Uh, here is the uh, short form. Small taxpayer will do a short form. A small taxpayer is uh, 10 million annual gross revenues uh, or less, uh, and they have an abbreviated form that you will fill out. I understand that they're looking at revising the 3115. Uh, I don't know when that will come out. I mean, we're late in the game, so uh, they're they're saying that they're going to revise it. Uh, a little bit to make it easier, but so far we have not seen that. And again, what we're going to do is we will hand out these pages to show you specific steps on completing the 3115. Yes, no answers, yes, no answers on those. So, so we'll have that too for you. 
So here's one of the challenges, you know, every client that has a building, you're going to have to write a description of that building and, and put it on the unit of property. I'm putting it in perspective for you how much work this is. So consider how many buildings you have in your portfolio. Each building is its unit of property, so on the 3115, you have to identify what is the new unit of property. How do you describe that? Here's, here's a menu of things that you could put, but more than likely it's a uh, one-story brick building that's an office uh, warehouse uh, you know, occupied by the owner at this address, possibly. You, you can use your own discretion as to how much uh, you would use to uh, put on there, but um, uh, know that you're going to have to describe each building. So if you can get your clients to write up those descriptions, that's even better. An example of the 481A adjustment. Anybody have done a 481A adjustment? Um, One, one of, the, and and I'll give you one other tip on the uh, on the 3115 on the uh, line 16, which uh, says um, I, I was at a CPA's office the other day and they says yes we've got a template that someone sent to us that says uh, here's how we should figure it out on 16 line 16 they had checked no it's like no on line 16 you want to check yes does the applicant request a conference with the IRS national office in the IRS if the IRS proposes an adverse response you want to check yes on that because if they're going to deny you you want them to fax you or call you and say we're about to deny your 3115 do you want to talk do you want to come in and talk so you want them to contact you and say, we're about to deny you because we're missing this, we don't have this, and so forth. So check yes on that box. You'll put an attachment with the name of the person that you want them to check, the fax number, and the phone number uh, of the person to call so that uh, you'll have a second chance in being able to get that, get that done. Okay, so again, we said rank clients' needs. First thing you want to do is determine who has a building. Query your database. Find all the building owners in your portfolio. You may already know those offhand, but those are the hardest ones to do. Those are the ones that you need to start asking, is there a late partial disposition? Is there something that you threw away that we need to write off? Units of property redefinition schedule. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And 3115s <clears throat> with a 481A adjustment. So if you have uh, some of the larger clients that are going to need a 481A, uh, these are some of the clients to look at, non-extension clients, large clients. So let's talk about uh, disposition real quick. So here's, here's the general framework, cost to improve, materials and supplies. These are all the areas that the, 30, uh, that the uh, regulations cover. Again, some of your clients have won the lottery. Late partial disposition. Um, everything's uh, in disposition, section 168, everything's the same with the exception of retirement or structural components of a building. The people on the far end can't see this, but there's a big mound of debris in front of this building where they rip the guts out of the building. That's not a pile of debris, that's a mound of deductions for your clients. The new regulations make that worth something. The problem was when they did it, nobody was standing next to the dumpster with a big chief notebook and a number two pencil writing down what went into the dumpster. So it's somewhat difficult for you to understand what was ripped out and what's the value of that. Clients with renovations, remodels, things that have been abandoned in place. You may need the help of a cost segregation expert to come and value that. It's complicated, takes a lot of work, and it needs to be documented. Document, document, document. So that you can write down the value and, and also write down the basis. Probably roofs. Roof is, the roof is probably one of the most common things that are still on the books, or possibly still on the books, and need to be written off. A business owner buys a 20-year-old building, replaces the roof after five years of ownership. When he bought the building, did that building come with a menu of prices of what all the components were worth? No. The, the value or the basis of that roof is hidden in that large number that says building basis X. You don't know what that is. So when you put the new roof on, more than likely the first roof, I don't know, you guys in this area capitalize roofs. It seems like the further south I go, the more, the more brazen they are to say, oh, we've been writing off roofs for 100 years. We, we knew that was stupid. 
congratulations, these new regulations have made you, you know, legal now for, for doing that. So these regulations are, allow you to write off that first roof. So if you have roofs in the past, we need to get those off the books. And going forward, anytime there's a roof replacement, you'll write down the first roof, you'll capitalize the second one, and you'll be able to take the write down of the first roof. So that's, that's one of the advantages of these um, regulations. And again, uh, can't say this enough, looking back, you only have this tax season to get that done. So what I'm urging you to do is query your database, find your clients, start looking at your depreciation schedules for improvements to say, and then ask him, what did you improve? Find a cost segregation company that will go through those with you. We, we have lots of clients that say, here are my depreciation schedules, look at those. Excuse me, let me, let me back up. You've taken the client information off of the depreciation schedule. You've taken the names and so forth. You've given me a data set, a hypothetical data set to look at. It has no relevance back to your client, to me. It's just a data set that I'll analyze and say, here's what that's worth. Here's what cost segregation would do. Here's what these asset valuations might be worth in this type, um, this type uh, analysis. So. So, so what I'm talking about is here are before and after pictures. It's an auto dealership for, for those guys in the back. Did a cost segregation on the building before. Showed them about $134,000 of accel accelerated cash flow. Uh, did a cost segregation on the renovation after it was done, but it was this number in the middle. Uh, those that can see the screen, uh, they ripped off this portion of the building, threw it into the dumpster to be able to create this. But what was all this worth? about $53,000 in cash. So you may have one or two or, or five clients in your portfolio that might have this opportunity for a significant amount of money. Do not lose that opportunity. Don't, don't be that guy where his buddy's playing golf on the golf course and go, did, they, did your CPA do a, a late partial disposition for you? No, really? Maybe you should talk to mine. Okay, so how do I get that number? The question you're asking is, if they've thrown something away, what process do I use? You can use, if there's no specific data, you can use any reasonable method. Cost segregation is a certain method. That's above a reasonable method. Uh, the IRS says you can use um, the producer price index, or pro rata allocation, or cost segregation. Those are, those are the three suggestions that they have. Let's, let's go through a, an example of doing a producer price index. Uh, owner has bought the building in 2005. Here, 10 years later, he needs to replace one of the uh, air conditioning units. That unit is worth 25,000. You've got an invoice for that unit. You know what that cost. Now, what's, what was the old one? You didn't have a menu of prices with that building, so you don't know what the old one costs. How do you break that out? Well, you would use the producer price index, discount that back for 10 years, a PPI rollback, and determine using that producer price index that that unit would have cost $20,000 10 years ago. Now you'll roll that forward, depreciating it for 10 years at 39 year rate, and now you come up with a number of that's the remaining basis in that item, which you can now write off and write down because that unit is gone and you're going to capitalize the new unit. So what's your reasonable method for this? So what I just showed you with PPI, that's good for restorations, that's good for a, a, a unit of something, but it's not real good for, for major restorations or renovations. So you're probably going to need a cost segregation specialist to determine What's the value of all these items that were taken out to be able to write down those, those items? When you write down the basis, it's a permanent tax savings at the time of sale for the client. So any five-year property that we can write off and take off the books, you've reduced the recapture rate from personal income tax rate. So five-year property, personal property, is the recapture is at personal income tax rate, which might be 40%. If you're able to write that off the books, well, then the rate is a 20% capital gains rate. So that's, that's a significant recapture um, savings there. In speaking with the IRS, they have said time and time again, when you make these calculations, make sure they're defendable. 
document, document, document how you came up with the numbers. Document how you valued these things. Um, that's what's using PPI. Document the process of what, of what you've done. OK, here's a part that's important to understand the improvement standards. I asked anybody to know about the Betterment Adaptation Restoration. Didn't get, didn't get many hands up, so let's, let's talk about that. The bar test. What's deductible and what has to be capitalized? So <coughs> next week, someone's going to come to you with that $25,000 invoice for that HVAC and say, what can I do with this? Is it a repair? Or do I have to capitalize that? Well, the question would be, what building was it on? You know, what's the value of the building? Or, or actually, well, you'll, you'll determine, is it a betterment? Adaptation, restorations. So in the regulations, and I won't go through each of these, but in the regulations, it gives you descriptions of what a betterment is. It gives you a def definition. Does it correct a material defect? Is there a material addition, material increase? So in betterment, faster, quicker, better, cheaper. Does the, the equipment run better? Use less electricity? You can read the definitions and, and look at that. They will give you, you must compare the condition of the property after the expenditure to the condition prior to the circumstances that necessitated the expenditure. So you're comparing just before and just after the expenditure is in a betterment. In the regulations, they don't have many bright lines to tell you specifically what a betterment is. But they give you lots of examples. Has anyone gone through the examples and looked at the examples? OK. So in that resource guide that I gave you, there's I've indexed the examples to where you can click on the button, and it'll take you to the betterment examples. Some of the older ones, there's, there's some newer ones as well, so that you can find the situation that's like your client's situation and say, OK, this is what I can do with this. There's about 20 betterment examples in, in the regulations as what that is. Adaptation is pretty um, self-explanatory. If it was a Walgreens and we turn it into a, a Jiffy Lube uh, oil chain shop, um, some, something dramatic, uh, it's no longer uh, its intended use, that's an adaptation. You won't have many of those. Restorations is a challenge for you to determine, is this a restoration and do I have to capitalize it? Does it return the unit or property to its ordinary efficient operating condition? If the property is deteriorated to a state of disrepair and no longer functional. So if you bought it, used it, it's worn out, and then you restore it, bring it back to like new, that's going to be a restoration. Major components perform a discrete and critical function of the unit of property. So we'll, we'll talk about these a little bit. Here's, here's one of the things, and, and I don't want to go through each of these definitions specifically, but I do want to point out something that's not in the regulations, something that was highlighted by Scott, um, Scott McKay of the US Treasury that helped write these regulations. He says it's no accident that there's a trend line in the regulations that typically you will find if the expenditure is maybe 25 to 30 percent of the basis or the fair market value of the item, more than likely that item is not, that effort expenditure is not going to be an improvement. It's going to be a repair. So when you look through the regulations, you will see an example of 100 out of 300 windows that were replaced is not a restoration. It's a repair. Three out of 10 rooftop HVAC units that were replaced is not an improvement, it's a repair. So they said we specifically wrote the examples to show below this kind of trend line, more than likely, if it doesn't meet the definitions, you can call that a repair. Uh, they show examples, 200 out of 300 windows were an improvement, did count as a restoration. Uh, replaced all the sinks versus uh, 80 out of 20 were, were not. 30% uh, of the electrical wiring was replaced in a building. That was a repair, not a restoration. Yet 40% of the square feet of the flooring was replaced, and they said that was a restoration. So they give you these examples. There's no hard, bright lines, but there are some trends in the regulations to, to use and to look at. 
Again, you've got some numbers there to kind of show you where those trends are. If it's not an improvement, then it's a refresh, and that's something that can be expensed or written off. Capitalization is not needed. Okay, so here's, here's the difficult part. If you can understand this part, you're in the top 20% uh, percent of all CPAs just understanding this part of the improvement regulations. When you have that invoice, that $25,000 invoice against that building, what do you compare it to? Do you compare it to the cost of the building? You know, is it 30% or less of the cost of the building? No. Um, that would be too easy. Uh, you'll have to determine is it a betterment adaptation restoration, but for buildings, what they did was they created building systems, nine listed building systems. And they also have building and structural components. So these are the nine listed building systems to say, if you have an expenditure on any of these items that are listed here, you will compare that invoice to the value of one of these nine building systems and make your determination, is that an improvement or is that a repair? The first one, building and structural components, well, what is that? Well, that's, that's actually everything past the nine. So everything that you would describe a, a building with, a roof, has roof, has floors, has windows, has doors. Those are all structural components, major components of that building. So just because something is not in the building system, if you replaced, um, again, 40% of the square foot of the, uh, of the flooring, you would have to take that invoice and compare it to the value of all the flooring throughout the building. Again, we talked about one of the examples was at 40%, that's something that you probably had to capitalize. So you're going to take that invoice and compare it to the value of the HVAC system. Well, again, when they bought the building, it didn't come with a menu of prices of what is the HVAC system worth. So it's going to be uh, somewhat difficult, or you'll take that invoice divided by the value of the HVAC system, and you can come up with that percentage and then make your choice from there. Also determine, does it meet the definition of a betterment adaptation or restoration? What I want to point out to you is this is a menu of prices. This is a cost segregation study. Cost segregation studies now will break out the five, seven, 15 year property, but they're also going to give you a menu of prices for those nine listed building systems. So I keep using an example of a $25,000 invoice on the HVAC system, where in this study, the HVAC system was worth $180,000. $25,000 versus 180, that's below the trend lines we see. That's a repair. Typically in the past, you might have said $25,000, whoa, that's big, we gotta capitalize that. So now you've got a, if you have a cost segregation study along with the building, you're going to have a better chance in being able to write off some of the expenditures that are going to come your way to be, able, to be able to determine, is this something that can call a repair or something that I have to capitalize? Uh, do you do a cost segregation just to get that, just to make those decisions? No. Your client's not going to pay for that. But if it does make sense for your client to take advantage of the uh, additional uh, depreciation deductions and the additional cash flow from converting to cost segregation, that's going to help, uh, help tremendously or help you make those decisions with your clients to determine uh, is this a repair or something that's capitalized. So again, the IRS is having you look at each building as a unit of property. Or if you do a cost segregation study, you can look at the building as five, seven, 15 year and 39 year property. The improvement standards have you look at the building in its parts and pieces. So it's important to know the value of the parts and pieces to determine is this invoice something that I can uh, write off as a repair or something that I have to call an improvement. So the IRS is having challenging or set up the system to where it's important to know what's the parts and pieces. And the menu of prices is cost segregation study to help you make those determinations. So what happens if you have multiple buildings on site? Anyone have an apartment complex? More than one building on, on the site? Okay. All in one line item right now on the depreciation schedule. Complex, X number of dollars. 39 year property or 27 and a half. 
since each building is now a unit of property, each unit of property has to be distinguished on the depreciation schedule as a separate line item. The challenge that they have created, or maybe one of the unintended consequences of these regulations, is each building needs its own, own basis. So you can't see it from over there, but what I have is a large apartment complex. Each of these buildings in the apartment complex is a unit of property. How do you break up that depreciation schedule to get it to where you're showing each of these buildings as a unit of property? The parking lot is a different unit of property. This is where a cost segregation study is going to do all that work for you if, if it needs to be done. If not, it's going to be challenging, very challenging. I asked the IRS in Chicago at the American Society of Cost Seg Professionals, I said, if you ask me as a cost seg professional to come in and do a, a cost seg study and I uh, reassign the basis to each of these buildings in an audit, you're going to ask me, who did I talk to? You're going to want to see the plans that I worked off of because I'm going to do it on a square footage basis. You're going to want to see the plans that I use. You're going to want to see what methodology did I use? What database did I use to, to make these determinations? You're going to want to see a lot of pictures for me to show that I was there and be able to tie my calculations to this particular building. I said, CPAs don't want to do that. CPAs can't do that or EAs can't do that. What's the shorthand way for them to do this and get this done? IRS guy, about 6'5", square jaw. There is no shorthand way. They need to get to work. There is no shorthand way they need to get to work. Now, luckily, he's not the spokesperson for the IRS, and he's not making all the decisions for them. But it go, does go to the fact, document, document, document on how you make these decisions. You don't want to create, uh, Eric Wallace always talks about, you don't want to create the facts for your clients. You want them to give you the facts. If you create the facts as to what all of these buildings are worth, well, then you're responsible to defend them. And then they're going to challenge you and say, how did you do these calculations? Most CPAs want to do this in, in less time than it takes to warm up a, a hot pocket in a microwave, right? <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's what we should have. I got 12 buildings, I got a million or 10 million, let's divide by 12 and we're done, right? right. Now, I, I, I would not do that because you have a parking lot. That needs to be separate. I don't know what the shorthand way is. I don't know how you get to those numbers easily. If you've done a cost segregation, I do cost segregation studies now on a per building basis. I'm going to give you a basis for each of those buildings. You have to st start tracking expenses on a per building basis. They come to you with that $25,000 air conditioning thing. First question you ask is, what building was that for? Oh my gosh, how are we going to get our clients to do that, right? I can't herd those cats as it is. How are we going to have them create that? It's one of the challenges that you have in educating your clients as to what, what to do. Again, we talked about here's some of the information, not all, but you know, some of the information that you might want to use in, in describing the building. Let's talk about some of the safe harbors. Safe harbors, familiar with that? These are the exceptions. These are the exemptions. Remember, it's, uh, we talked about um, you're going to have to capitalize everything unless there's an exemption. So materials and supplies, probably the hardest uh, parts of the regulations to understand for the least amount of money. <coughs> Costing less than $200, you can call them material and supply. Fuels and lubricants, materials and supply. Here's the area that's, that's different, non-incidental materials. If they buy it and they don't use it in 12 months, you're going to have to show it or keep it on the books. You're going to have to defer writing that off till the time it's used or consumed. So right now you're probably buying materials and supplies and you're writing them off in the year that they're bought. Non-incidental materials, method code 186, you're going to have to file that on 3115 and say, I'm going to follow this regulation that I'm going to have to wait until it's used or consumed. Uh, 187, you probably want to use that one as well for incidental materials as, as well. You're probably already doing that, but Bob uh, has suggested that you probably want to want to do that anyway. If it rises above a material and supply, de minimis safe harbor. So depending on what uh, financial statement they have, 
applicable financial statement, if they have an audited return, they can write off to $5,000 per invoice or per item. You can have multiple items on an invoice, but audited return, that's a pretty high standard. So the majority of your clients are not gonna meet that standard, they're gonna be at $500 per invoice or per item substantiated by the invoice. Keep the invoice, that's your record there. So if you have multiple items on that invoice, um, again, chairs, $400, we got 10 of them. You can still write those off because on a per basis, uh, you're okay. Must have a policy in place. That's where we had to do something before January 1st. Do your clients have a capitalization policy in place that says this? Did you think that they, maybe they should have that? Do you think retroactively that'd be a good practice? Okay, they have it. Doesn't have to be in writing, doesn't have to be conveyed. You know, hey, we're assuming that you've got this policy in place. Best practice would be to have that AICPA written capitalization policy on their letterhead to say, this is our policy. That's the best practice, but it's a pretty low standard. So if they thought about it or they thought they needed it, okay, they got it, right? Best to have a document with a date on it that says, you know, here, here's how we're going to do that. But here's the capitalization policy that I re referenced, and you can get a PD or Word document of that uh, as well. Routine maintenance on a, on a building. If they expect to do it more than once in a 10-year period, they can apply for this, the 3115. This is just routine maintenance. This is important for apartment complex owners. They're constantly doing routine maintenance. You want to put on the 3115, Here's the routine maintenance that we're probably going to do. We're going to replace the carpet. We're going to replace the cabinets every two years or so. You, again, requires 3115. The small taxpayer safe harbor. Um, if the building is less than a million and their annual income is less than 10 million, three-year average, they can have the small taxpayer safe harbor where they can write off up to $10,000 are 2% of the unadjusted basis on a building by building basis. Again, you're tracking buildings as each unit of property so that, um, you know, apartment complex, each building, if it's below a, a million, they've got the, uh, the ability to write off $10,000 of improvements, not repairs, things that are above repairs that are improvements. Again, 2% of the unadjusted basis, $300,000 building, that's only about $6,000. That limit, the 10,000 or 2%, is reduced by the routine maintenance that they take and the de minimis safe harbor that they take. So those, whatever they're taking there, will come off the top of that 10,000 and then that will be their limit. If you go over the limit, it's a cliff. You don't get any of it. So again, Important to track expenses on a per building basis to make sure you stay under this on a yearly basis to say, if you're close to the 10,000, wait and do that next year. So we can get that $10,000 write off. If you go to 11,000, we lose everything. We lose the ability to write off the first 10,000. So again, that's something for your clients to, to be aware of and to track. So here's some of the questions that you ask your clients that have buildings. Can you provide me a written description of the building? Have you done any renovations or remodels? Because if you have, I gotta, I gotta follow 3115 and we gotta get that late partial disposition. Do you do routine maintenance, perform more than once every 10 years? I have to follow 3115 and ask for permission to write that off. Is the building cost basis above or below one million? If it's below the million, you get an opportunity to write off some of those improvements. Do we have to reconfigure your depreciation schedule? You've got multiple buildings here. I have to charge you to assign a basis to those buildings and the parking lots. So the IRS is driving you to go to a segregated cost model here. Straight line, straight line is probably not beneficial to your clients. They're going to a segregated uh, model of, of depreciation. Apply the improvement standards. I need to be able to, you need to tell me, what building is this invoice on? What is it on? Was it one, on one of the listed building systems? Is cost segregation favorable? Now is the time to look through your portfolio and determine which of my clients can probably use cost segregation. I see a national trend emerging where the larger firms, the more sophisticated firms, are 
uh, going to cost segregation. Don't let them come and take your client because you didn't introduce the idea of cost segregation to them. Because if it's worth $100,000 to your client, you want that information coming from you, not from your competition. Again, in the portfolio here, um, the phases that you'll probably go through, uh, things that you will probably have to do. Uh, I won't go through the list here because I want to save time for, for questions. And um, here's some of the things that you'll be challenged with. Put your dear client letter in place. Talk to your clients. Uh, how are we going to file all these 3115s? De minimis, safe harbor, all the things that you need to uh, discuss with your clients. Um, and again, the uh, cost segregation is, is important to discuss as well. So let's let's yeah, go well, ahead and open it up for questions. Right. What we want to do before we open it up for questions, uh, two quick things. I wanted to first of all mention that uh, I didn't mention. We're going, there's a great opportunity to mention. We have a map meeting on February 25th. That'll be held at uh, the On Parade Diner in the morning, and the topic will be appropriately billing and collections. So as a continuation of this, you'll learn how to bill. Workflow, workflow billing and collections led by Robert Brown, Larry Bloom, and Al um, Lanny Elias. So uh, please, uh, we'll learn how to bill and collect for all of this. With that, before we open it, and then we'll immediately open it up to questions, we'll walk around with the microphones. We've changed our format a little. We'll walk around with the microphones to get in as many questions as we can. But before we do that, I know that Bob Goldfarb has been following the 3115 uh, changes and uh, the implementation very carefully. So Bob, shed us some light. <laughs> Okay, I just want to, um, I, 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 I know there are a ton of questions because I can see people are restless and we'll try to get to the questions. But I think one of the big issues that, that everybody's struggling with is the 3115 and the 481A adjustments. Um, and I'll try to answer as many of those questions as I can. But I, I do want to, I, I know you guys have the old slide deck at this point, as, as do I. So um, these are the best slides that I've seen any production whatsoever, and I've seen probably about eight or nine of them. Um, I would, I, you know, if you can write down certain slides that I think are the best of the, of the group that you have that you really should keep as reference. I have slide number 29, um, 35, 29, 35, 55, 56, yeah, bingo. <laughs> 57 to 80, 80. Well, those were the ones that he put up here, and you'll see, I'll explain why those are crucial. Those are really good definitions for you. And then 81 to 87 is the next set of slides, and, um, and number 93. So those, I think, are really the best of, the, of, of a really great slide deck. Um, so there's, there's a lot of controversy um, I didn't break that, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, the 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 concept of the 3115, the 3115 is a requirement, in my opinion, it's a requirement under the current rules because it is an adoption of what the IRS is telling you is your change of methodology. The truth of the matter is you probably aren't changing very much of what you've already been doing. But you need the permission to tell the IRS that we are going to be in compliance with what you tell us to be in compliance with. Makes no sense, all right? Um, and by the way, um, most of you know I merged my firm. I sold my firm and merged it into another one April of 2013, pretty much the same time as these regs came out. So if you think there's a correlation there, there is. <laughs> um, some of you may want to rethink some of, you, some of what you're doing next year. Um, but in any event, um, there are people within the IRS, nothing in writing, and we've been in, in consultation with the IRS that says you don't need to file the 3115 if you're adopting the regs. There's nothing in writing to support that position. And we know from the professional groups that are bombarding the IRS at this point, asking them, do we need to file the 3115? And nobody is really putting in writing that you don't have to. 
So what's the strategy? What do you do? Um, right now, the AICPA and other professional groups, such as Nick Papp, are basically saying one of two things. And that's what our firm is doing. Prepare your returns, wait another week or two or three or six months or nine months and, to file the returns and see what the IRS ultimately tells us. They'll, they, they say that they will give us some guidance maybe in two to three weeks, maybe. They'll probably give it to us September 16th um, or October 16th, right after the filing season. Um, we don't know. The other thing is file the tax return with or without the 3115, I would suggest with it, and then file an amended return without it if you need to. A lot of wasted time. I don't see the downside in filing the 3115 except for the fact that it's a waste of time. You know, it's an eight-page document that you have to file twice, once with the tax return and once in Ogden. You must do both. And I have not seen where the 3115 is electronically fileable in Ogden. So now you're filing electronically in Holtzville or uh, rather wherever, where, where, now, where those damn files are going, um, electronically. <laughs> and then, and then like, uh, like David says, there's some warehouse in Ogden that has all the 2848s, 3115s, all the things the IRS doesn't get to, and they just burn them whenever they, uh, they have too many. Um, you know, do they look at those? I, I can't imagine they do, but if you don't file it, there really is a circular 230 potential problem there. Uh, Karen Hawkins will, will alert you to a problem that you may or may not have. Um, so to me, I, I think it was slide 35 or 55 where the codes were listed. Those codes are critical. When you're filing the 3115, right on page one of the 3515, it says what, what, um, what, he's going to try to bring him up. What adoptions are you picking up? Usually it's um, 184, 186, 187, and I believe 193. 192. Those are the codes you probably want to put on the 3115. Um, I would also suggest that maybe you do a template. Do 13115 and then just keep changing because all the yes no questions for the most part are going to be the same. All right. The biggest thing with the regs, in my opinion, are the are the definitions of what David was talking about: betterments, improvements, and restorations. And, you know, this is really, it was designed, it's not what happened, but it was designed to simplify, <laughs> yeah, right, to simplify for us and IRS agents on audit. Remember, we used to do facts and circumstances. When we did, when we did a lot of depreciation, we did facts and circumstances. So in my facts, we're always throw everything into cost of goods sold. No, I'm only kidding. I didn't do that. Um, but, you know, my facts were always different than the IRS's facts. And, and what I did always seemed to differ with the IRS, and we would always have banter back and forth. The regs were designed to try to eliminate that problem. <laughs> I don't think they did a great job, maybe for the bigger firms. And the, the big four, the big 15, the big 35, they're going to make a fortune on filing these 3115s. I'm going to make a fortune billing for the 3115s. I'm not going to collect a dime for any of them. But there's a lot of work. So I would suggest maybe a template, file, prepare one, and then just use them and change the fact and circumstance per client that you need to. I mean, that's my suggestion. Um, I'll take questions or problems. Go ahead. Um, yes. And we'll take questions to any of the uh, presentation that was offered today. I'm just going to go in random order. I saw your hand up first. Okay. okay. Since the new regulations trump the statute of limitations, when you look back on your depreciation schedules, right? You could buy a building in 95. You spend $500,000 in the building. In 2003, three, four, you could have spent thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, and it's called improvements. You don't have those records anymore. What do you do? Essentially, you're going to have to, you're going to probably have to do either get a cost segregation 
and, and allocate the cost. You don't even know what it was at this point. Well, you put down improvements on you put down oh. improvements on a tax return. Well, 2003, you probably wrote most of them off already. I don't know. You know, you're going to have to continue to depreciate them the way they are. <clears throat> and, 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 and so a lot of times we'll, we will go out and interview the owner and say, show me what you did. Okay, we had a wall right here that was taken out. Here's the, if we have demolition plans, that's fine. But we can go and interview people and do deduction construction, so to speak, to define what was there, assign values to that, and, and be able to write that off as, as best we can. But you're right, that is a challenging situation. There, there are some situations where we can do some modeling and so forth to get some of that and document that. So. We are not going to have all your answers because there are no answers to a lot of these things, unfortunately. Bob, quick yeah. question. Go you ahead. have an uh, individual client out here on Long Island who has 10 rental properties. Do you need 10 3115s at that point? It should be one per property, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. All right, then the, the last, just real I quick. know, I know, I know. How many of them do you do? And, and by the way, we, Nick Papp and the AICPA and the, the enrolled agents, are trying, we are trying to get the IRS to accept the fact that we put a statement in the tax return, just a clear statement that we were going to be in compliance with the regs. Um, that really is what the 3115 is is making you do or suggesting that you're doing, so we're trying to get them to, to approve a concept of just a statement. By the way, we will, we will shoot each and every one of you a form letter that we suggest you mail to your congressperson, the two U.S. senators in New York, and the commissioner of IRS. Please just put your letterhead, your, your, your letterhead at the top. Um, sign it, modify it any way you want. It will be a suggested letter. But imagine, imagine if we get a million preparers to send in these letters. It will bombard these people. And at the end, I would just say, if you think this is, uh, is irrational, imagine receiving millions and millions of more 3115s. <laughs> um, one, yeah, I'm not in control of the money. One other quick question. Take your doctor that's been in practice for 30 years. He hasn't bought a piece of equipment in, in forever. Right. You're doing 3115s on this guy too? Well, that 3115, to me, to me, anytime I, I feel anytime I have a 4562, I'm going to put a 3515. Now, now that's not that, that's not to say that if the business started January 1st, 2014, you don't need the 3115 because you're adopting January 1, 14. If you're not, if you haven't depreciated anything, if you have a service business with no depreciation, you're not adopting. However. However, um, I, I, I wasn't able to listen to everything David said. I assume he mentioned it. There are, there are, there's at least one election that you really should be making on the de minimis rules. The de minimis rules, there is a, a check the box that, um, in, in your software that will produce a, an election for, for the um, de minimis rules, the 500 um, and the $5,000 uh, de minimis rules and um, the, the de minimis rule for the uh, real estate, the buildings. And um, um, one, one other thing I just lost out of my head, but I'll, I'll remember it somewhere. Okay. Hello? Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah. I have a building. Its cost is $3 million. But because of a 1031 transaction, its adjusted basis is only... $250,000. I put in a $50,000 roof. Do I compare the actual cost or to the adjusted basis? Fair market value. You, you would compare it to the fair market value of the roof. So not, not what's on the basis, but if you had to go out and replace the roof, what was the cost of that? No, I'm saying when, you, when you're doing this, uh, you, would it be a repair or would it be an improvement? Based Because uh, you used some equations there, fractions. And I wasn't sure if you use adjusted basis or the fair mark, the actual fair market value you, you of the building. You would use an adjusted basis. So, so if the, the, the complete value of the, the building is diminished, you're, you're going to have a diminished value of that roof. So it's the adjusted basis. I think you're going to have to go with the adjusted basis because the, the 
the roof would be more than the adjusted basis. Right. The write off. Right. You know, I'm sorry? And really, with, with the So there would be an exchange, improvement. You're saying it would be an improvement because the adjusted basis is so tiny. But you can, write off, you can write off the fraction of the. Oh, yeah, okay. I could do a cost analysis and write yeah. off uh, for, to $5,000. The original dollars. roof against the 250000 adjusted basis. Right. One quick other question, because I've looked into this uh, 3115 before, and it's been suggested that uh, instead of trying to figure out uh, which method code applies, just put all of it. Any problem? You, you is, can, are they going to reject that? You, you can do that, but I don't know if your software will allow you to put a million codes. There well, are a lot you, of them. You can, there's, there's two lines there. There's one line that has the IRS codes. I was told you can bypass that, and if you use, I think it's B, uh, B, you could, you could write in anything you want. You can say 187 to 193. Because there's okay. two lines that DS for two, I understand. Two I didn't. I don't know the software. That's why I have staff. People when you look at the form, so. when you look at the form, the line that asks for the code okay. there's an IRS code, and then there's the reg section. Right. Those are the re, those You are figure the, that one out. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. A client uh, owns a building in a sub S corporation, sells it in April of 2014. <laughs> If any of this work results in additional depreciation, is the gain on the building now subject to recapture? Is it considered ordinary and therefore capital gain? In other words, if I'm able to get another $100,000 of depreciation and now I sell the building. Yeah. It, yeah. Is, it's, 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 nothing changed. That doesn't change. No. It's, Ordinary, I'm sorry. It's a, it's an ordinary deduction, and it's yeah. a capital gain for the additional it's, yeah, depreciation. The it's not like recaptured, like an accelerated depreciation. It's not an accelerated depreciation, but it is depreciation recapture. Let me let me just um, David reminded me of something else that um, that he his his company will do for you. Um, and there are two two or three points that I need to make. Um, I'm not advertising for anybody. It's the you know you make your own decisions. But but um, they will take your depreciation schedules from any of your clients um, and look at the depreciation schedules to see if it makes cost effective sense for you to do a cost segregation. Now, just because it's out there doesn't mean that it's cost effective, especially if you're going to sell the building in a year or two if there's expectation. Then you wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't urge you to do that, but they will, they will do free of charge to, to sort of scrub your depreciation schedule, look through it, and see if it makes any sense for you to do this. If you do do this, if you do that, um, I urge you to make sure you eliminate the EIN and you eliminate the name of the client on that form. Without doing both of those things, you are in violation of Circular 230. You are disclosing client information that you are not allowed to disclose um, by not removing that information. So please, if you do it, be very, very cautious if you do do it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Rona. Hi. Yeah, hi. A taxpayer more than $10 million in sales makes the election with an AFR, okay, makes the election for $5,000, correct? Yep. Doesn't, every, every, even though it's over $10 million in sales. You're talking about an AFP? I'm talking about... The, the applicable the, financial yeah, statement? Yeah, the AFR. AFS. Uh, AFS. Okay. Yeah, the AFS. AFS sorry, okay. AFS, more than $10 million in sales, though. They're enti still entitled to that $5,000 de minimis election? We're, we're, we're kind of confusing apples and oranges. So as long as yeah. they have an audited return, right. doesn't mean... Correct. If, if there are now, $5 million, an audited that's a, that's return a, also include a reviewed return? No. Okay, no. So this is a no. point I wanted to make. That, 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 is, that is one of the points I wanted to make. An AFS, an applicable financial statement, is an audited financial statement. However, um, and I have to re-research re, re this in the regs, it also says that it says a, a financial statement that, that is fileable with the SEC – which obviously is an audited financial statement, or or any other governmental agency. So that could be the financial statement of your RPIEs, which is theoretically an audit, but 
I don't know how many of you yeah. do that much work. But that's what it says. I, and I, I don't know the, uh, the details of it, but that is one thing I wanted to mention. The other thing I, wanted, I also want to mention is that um, the, the accounting associations are trying to get us relief with that statement that I talked to you about before. But it seems like if there is going to be relief, they're going to talk about, the IRS is going to possibly talk about relief for smaller um, businesses. Their definition of small business is unlikely to be the same definition as a small company within the regs. So there's going to be two kinds of small firms. Those that are $10 million of less of revenue for the AFS and the de minimis uh, write-offs, and perhaps a smaller small business for relief of the 3115. And they're talking maybe $5 million or less in sales, averaged over some period of time. Bob, we don't know, but that's what seems to be the banter at this can point. Can I get some clarification on that? So if you have more than $10 million of sales, can you make that de minimis um, election for the 500, 5,000, whatever the case may be? I would make the election. Um, I think you could still write off the 10,000. I think you could. I'm not positive. We have to look. I just. So the, the ten million dollars in sales number is for the small taxpayer safe harbor in relationship to the building. That's it. It's just to the building. So so what you're saying is can I take advantage of the five thousand under the minimus? So that's under a different reg. So so there's no ten million dollar restriction. Yeah, hi. Rona, what's the name of the form we file with the city every, for all the buildings? Jerry, Jerry, we can't hear you. Okay. Even the RPIE say. form, does that have the abbreviation on it? Okay. We were thinking about using the RPIE forms um, for an AFS. The problem is there's no depreciation on it. Yeah, but it's a financial statement. It doesn't matter what is on the on the AFS per se. It's you're adopting the the information that's on the financial statement. You're happy. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm retired. Okay. What do I care. <laughs> St Steve Sternleaf has been waiting very patiently, and then we'll move it around. I'm going to go a little different way. Uh, from what I heard earlier. Do we have to file a 3115 for anyone that takes office supplies? <laughs> the, the 30, yes, yes. The, the answer is yes, because you're adopting the regulations and the ability to write off the office supplies and materials is under the new reg. So, so yes. So anyone that has office or computer supplies now, we have to? At this point, yeah. Do, do, do they buy okay. a toner? I'll play favoritism. Any questions from this table? <laughs> that, that, that's a very difficult question. You know, paper might not have to. Toner would have to. Okay. Uh, it's 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 somewhat. Ross. No, you don't. No. No. Okay. Not the uh, way. Not the way you, we use paper. Not the question I want to ask, but I wanted to drop a line for him. Since these regs are in effect. If he goes and doesn't elect these regs and then sells his building, is it depreciation allowed or allowable? So because he didn't take the depreciation on the building, he's got to recapture it anyway? You're saying if he doesn't, if he doesn't do the, the cost seg and write he, off the... He plans on selling the building in a year and a half. He doesn't do the cost seg study now. He doesn't take all this extra depreciation. Does he lose it because it's allowed or allowable under the regs? The basis, the basis stays. I don't see, I don't see a problem with the basis change. Yeah. All right. And, no, I, I don't. I want to go back to the old facts. Because and it's, a, it's a methodology. Oh. It's the methodology that right. you're allowed he, to select. He, he can keep it a yeah. straight line. Here's, here's my question, and it really goes back to the facts and circumstances test. We have a client that has steam pipes that go between buildings, sometimes under New York City's uh, streets, <laughs> and they have a leak in these pipes, and what they have to do is dig up Second Avenue and literally block traffic, cranes, the whole works, $2 million to put a piece of patch over a small hole in the pipe, which could break a day later. Is that a repair? 
Or is that a capitalization? That pipe is not one ounce better than it was the day before. I'm just like you, Ross. I'm an accountant. I'm giving this to the engineer. <laughs> you, you would take tax advice from an engineer from Louisiana? Come on. I understand. Your pipes worked really well down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. A- ask BP how well those pipes work. Uh, okay. No, the, the facts and circumstances is the question. Are they completely out the door now? I, I, I don't have an answer for you on that, but that's a difficult situation. Con- consult your local tax professional. <laughs> that's good. Hi. I was at a seminar a few months ago on the same topic, and we were told that the 481 adjustment is not additional depreciation, that it's an ordinary expense and should be disclosed on your return as Section 481 costs or deduction. Does that still hold true as far as you know? I, 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 if you're asking do you have to do the 481 adjustment calculation, I don't think you do. I agree that you don't have to do that. Disclosing it as a 481 adjustment, I, I, don't, I don't know that I would necessarily do that. Would you do it as additional depreciation? I haven't thought that far. Maybe. Okay. I'm, I, there's no harm in doing that. Um, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. Okay. I have another question. Okay. If you service small clientele and all you prepare for them are compiled financial statements, and for the last 20 years you've used $1,000 as your cutoff for capitalizing, do you have to change now? and elect $500. I, no, you don't. So the de minimis safe harbor is not a de minimis ceiling. So if you have an approved policy where 1000 is appropriate for you, you can keep that. Know that you're going, if you go with 1000 know you're going to be challenged. They're going to challenge you in an audit. Why are you at 1000 not at the 500 So you want to put everything that you can under the 500 and just put those items that are above that in, in the thousand basis. So it's a get out of jail free, everything below 500 under the de, de minimis, uh, but it doesn't mean that you have to change your plan if your your, your depreciation is above so that you 500. So you do not have to follow 3115 for that then? No. Because you're not changing or adopting a new policy? Uh, the minimum safe harbor is an annual election, so there's no 3115 required in that. You just need a, maybe a written policy somewhere. You need somewhere. a written, written policy to say, here, here's our capitalization policy. So in that, that case, you may say, we're going to put as much as we can under de minimis. and go. I, I do want to make a quick point on the 481A adjustment. So when you're doing these 3115s and you have an adjustment and you've looked back, you're going, you may have some net negative 481A adjustments that's good for your client, and you may have some positive 481A adjustments that's not good for your client. You don't want to combine those. You want to keep those separate uh, because the the negatives, the ones that's favorable to your clients, they can take it in this tax year. Some of the positive adjustments may be able to to be stretched out for for four years. So it's it's important. If you have those known issues on the depreciation schedule, you have to have the discussion with your client. This is wrong. We probably need to change it, and this is the year to change it because you're going to get four years to be able to change that. If we don't change it and we leave it, you know, we don't want to wake that sleeping dog, we just got to leave it, and you're caught later, you're going to pay interest and you're going to pay penalties on that. So if there's a known issue, now is the time to correct those things because we see in these regulations that they're going to start reviewing depreciation schedules in future audits down the road to make sure you've got this right. So keep your negative and your positive 481A adjustments separate so you can take advantage of the negatives this year and stretch out your payments uh, for four years. Come in we do a lot of co-op and condos that don't file regular 1120s. Does this still apply? Do we still have to file the 3115s? I, I missed the question. I'm sorry. We do a lot of co-op and condo buildings that don't file regular 1120s. Do we still have to do the 3115s with an 1120H or an 1120C? I don't know definitively, but I would think yes. I don't know. I don't know. I would think you do, but I don't know. Sorry. Okay. Any other questions from this side of the room? 
10.02. 10.02. We'll start to wrap it shortly. He's also our timekeeper. <laughs> I, I think I'll stay was, later. I don't care. But. I think this was covered earlier. I just want to verify. So if you're a 1114 new business, you don't have to make an election because you're following this anyway. Okay. Let, be careful what, you, what, what the question is. You do not have to do a 3115. You should do the de minimis election. The, as David said, the de minimis elections are annual elections, regardless of filing the 3115. Okay. So if you're a 1114 new business, mark the box for the elections, but you do not have to do a 3115. And also, yeah. if you have a Schedule E with a building, these rules still apply, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, we did get some questions, Bob. Uh, we also, and, and Dave, we also got some questions about, again, uh, repeating what you had said about IRS's uh, position at the moment and the fact that they're reviewing it. If you can just embellish that one more time for us uh, in terms of uh, the, what, what the latest, regu latest what, is. What the IRS is contemplating to, to eliminate the need for filing the 3115 with the tax return or at all, and in, in lieu of the 3115, just putting a statement in there that says we're adopting the um, cost the um, the cost versus repair uh, capitalization um, uh, regulations as of 1-1-2014. When there was one question here too. Did, when you said unit of property... Talking to the mic, I, I can't hear. A unit of property, one, if one of my clients has a 30 apartment house building, is it 30 units of property or is it one apartment house? How are they defining that? I think it's each, each building is a unit of property. So you're going to have to readjust your depreciation schedule to see each building as a unit of property. Start tracking the expenses on a per building basis. And each, each apartment in the building... Each, okay. Okay. Oh, well, that's that's per building, so yeah. not per apartment. I'm going to take one more official question. Our speakers will be able to stay. I wanted to, on behalf of all of us, we thank them again very much for both last night and this morning. We are going to take one more question. Please see your sponsors on the way out and fill out the evaluations. One more question.